1979, director Francis Ford Coppola and star Martin Sheen gave the world a fever dream of a film that examined the horrors of war. In 2021, Heaven Hill gives us a bottom shelf favorite bourbon. The film is Apocalypse Now. The whiskey is J.W. Dant, Bottled and Bond. And we'll review them both. This is the Film and Whiskey Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week we are looking at the 1979 classic, Apocalypse Now. Hey, fun, son. Nothing else in the world smells like that. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. You know, one time we had a hail bomb. For 12 hours, when it was all over, I walked up. We didn't find one of them, not one stinking body. Smell! You know that gasoline smell? A whole hill. Smells like... Victory. Brad, we are wrapping up a series that we've been doing of films from the 1970s. It's been really interesting to kind of gauge your reactions to these movies. I think you'd only seen one or maybe two of them before, and we've had a few highs, a few lows, and we're wrapping up here just as the 1970s wrapped up with Francis Ford Coppola's epic Vietnam War movie, Apocalypse Now. Yeah, Bob, the crazy thing about this movie is it's like the movie that I watch to go to sleep every night. (laughs) Just the most soothing like, mm. like, man, Counting Sheep's got nothing on this film. Oh, all right. So it sounds like we already know where you're falling on this one, huh? <laughs> Bob, I've never seen this movie before. And I honestly, it's one of those films where watching it made me realize, I think that the only Vietnam War film I've really ever seen was We Were Soldiers. Oh, wow. Really? So you've never seen like Platoon? Platoon, or... Deer Hunter. Full Metal Jacket. Uh, yeah, full, yeah, I've honestly... If you could categorize wars into like their own little film universes, I know almost nothing about the Vietnam War film universe. Wow. Okay. So I think this is an interesting place for you to kind of start that that look into the universe then because, you know, this movie, Brad, is in some ways, I think, a fairly accurate depiction of kind of the chaos and the absolute show that was the Vietnam War. But at the same time, it's it's nothing like the Vietnam War. And I was actually looking up just, you know, some articles that were listing what these former soldiers thought were the most accurate depictions of Vietnam on film. And none of them mentioned Apocalypse Now. And I think, you know, it makes a lot of sense because the basis of this movie was the Joseph Conrad novella Heart of Darkness, which was initially set in Africa and in the early 1900s. And they just transplanted it to be a story that was set in Vietnam. So, like, Vietnam's the backdrop of this movie, but I think we could both pretty easily agree that it's not necessarily an accurate depiction of that war. Yeah, I think that when you really boil this movie down, it it is a unique film in the fact that I feel like it spans a few different genres, and war film is is one of them. But the war part of the film is more an analysis of the human heart. And like evil and why there is darkness in the world uh, more so than it says anything about war itself. Well, Brad, maybe this is a good place for us to just kind of get Brad explains out of the way here. You know, we have been having a lively conversation about this movie uh, before we hit record. And I know we want to get pretty quickly into our analysis portion here of the movie. But before we do that, we have to talk about what the movie really is about. So I know this was your first time seeing Apocalypse Now, and that means that it's time for Brad Explains, the part of the podcast where Brad breaks down the plot of the movie that he has just seen often for the first time. Brad, as you know, we have a 60-second time limit on Brad Explains this season. Can you break down the plot of this movie in one minute or less? Yeah, dude, it's the African queen on acid. That's it. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> that's actually that's actually really accurate. I'm telling you, man, it's just got a younger version of a bogey yeah. on on the boat. <laughs> Oh, man. No. So Apocalypse Now is a film about a young army captain um, played by Martin Sheen uh, called Willard, and he is sent on a top secret mission to kill another army special forces commander named Kurtz, who has pretty much gone insane and is living deep in the forest and is just a wild dude now and killing everybody. And so the journey is portrayed on a Navy boat that is slowly being piloted up river by its captain and young crew. And really the movie follows them as they examine how different people deal with the atrocities of war. Um, you have one of the mo- most famous movie characters of all time, Lieutenant Colonel Bill Kilgore, who is obsessed with American culture and surfing and uses war as a way to obtain those, those restful things Um, But by the end of it, things have just gotten crazier and crazier, and it really feels like an acid trip. And at the temple that – yeah, that's it. Yeah, I had to cut you off, man. You actually ran over a little bit, but it was was so good that I wanted you to just just continue on. (laughs) So, Brad, when we were first talking about this movie, and I was trying to kind of prepare you to watch it, I think the first movie that I compared it to in terms of its pacing, in terms of its structure – was Sicario, which was a movie that we both really, really liked. We just watched a few months ago. And I think that, you know, as I started watching this movie, I got about, I'd say, two thirds of the way through it. And I said, wow, I was really, really on point with my Sicario comparison. This is, you know, kind of a slowly moving, slow building, suspense building movie, you know, about someone's kind of odyssey into the depths of hell. You know, in Sicario, it's getting deeper and deeper into this, the world of the cartels in Apocalypse Now, it's getting deeper and deeper into America's intervention in Vietnam and the way that they are just completely botching the whole thing. Your mission is to proceed up the Nung River in a Navy patrol boat. Pick up Colonel Kurtz's path at New Mung Ba. Follow it. Learn what you can along the way. When you find the... Colonel infiltrate his team by whatever means available and terminate the colonel's command. Terminate the colonel. He's out there operating without any decent restraint, totally beyond the pale of any acceptable human conduct. And he is still in the field commanding troops. Terminate. With extreme prejudice. But then the last third of the movie happened, and I said, well, this is not like Sicario at all. You know, this movie really <laughs> not even is, a- this movie really is like just a a mixture, an amalgam of a lot of different kind of genres. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think it does have the, you know, it definitely has the action elements, the war elements. It's definitely a farce at parts. It's satirical. Like the whole stuff with Robert Duvall's character, Kilgore. Is It's actually pretty funny, but it's like really darkly funny that the way that they are literally just like bombing entire villages so that they can go surf, you know, and and you get the sense that like, well, then maybe this isn't too far off of what was actually happening over there. But then by the end of it, it becomes this really trippy, hallucinogenic, philosophical treatise, uh, you know, of what's right and what's wrong and Brando's being worshipped like a god and it just it goes in a completely different direction than you're expecting it to go. Yeah. And it it really turns. I feel like once you get to the Playboy show where they have like the playmates um, trying to entertain the, the troops, like once you get past that scene, everything just spirals really, really quickly. And I I think that I don't know the start of this film was intriguing and it it drew me in a little bit once they actually got onto the journey. But I, I felt like the opening scene where, you know, Martin Sheen is kind of having, whether it's a drug trip or just PTSD, you know, or he's, you know, an alcoholic, I I don't know, but the opening scene happens. And at first I was down with it. I was like, yeah, with the doors are playing and like the fan reminds him of a helicopter and napalm strikes. And I'm like, yep, I like I'm down with all this. And then Martin Sheen started doing like Tai Chi yep. and punching the glass and like getting blood all over the room. 
And I remember just thinking to myself, huh, this is going to be one of those movies. <laughs> it's, it's, this is about to be really, really weird. And then, like you said, for the first like, you know, half of the movie after that, I was like, oh, no, this is like a pretty good, you know, Vietnam War film. Nope, I was right. <laughs> Well, I and I trust think, in my gut. I think that's kind of where kind of where this movie struggles, Brad, because I'll, I'll out myself. I don't think that this movie is the masterpiece of all masterpieces that it was made out to be over the last 30 plus years. Right. You know, it had kind of a lukewarm reception when it first came out and then very quickly kind of ascended the ranks, especially among directors. They really love this movie. I'm not quite there with them on that. And I think that this movie is kind of wildly uneven in parts. And the thing that really gets me, Brad, I guess the word that I would really use for this movie is just indulgent. It's a really self-indulgent movie on the part of Coppola. And I think the reason that I say that is because he tries to marry these two concepts or, you know, the screenwriter, John Milius, started out with the the task of adapting Heart of Darkness to the Vietnam War. And I think from the beginning, that idea has some interesting things about it. But I think the movie really does struggle to balance, like, how much are we going to stick to the plot of Heart of Darkness, which does end with this, you know, this guy being worshipped like a god and having to rescue him from that. And and how much are we going to balance that against the backdrop of the Vietnam War? And I think for the first two thirds of the movie, it very loosely follows the structure of Heart of Darkness. And then at the end, it's like, all right, well, we're just going to go ahead and go full throttle on this Heart of Darkness motif. And we're going to have... Marlon Brando having his own village that is surrounded by people who are literally worshiping, worshiping him like a god. And the movie just takes such a weird turn. And I I really don't know who else to blame for that except for Coppola, because at every turn, it seems like where you when you know where this movie is going to go, he he either makes a scene run on way too long or he just makes some head scratching decisions. Yeah, I, honestly, I think a comparison for me on this film for a few different reasons, is 2001 A Space Odyssey. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like I went into that movie knowing that it's long, it's a little bit overwrought, but it's, you know, quote unquote, top three greatest films of all time. And I, I know that probably not a ton of people might say the same thing about Apocalypse Now, but the way I've read about it on the internet since I watched it, I would say a lot of people would put this in like their top 10 all time films. And so I, I'm just in a place where similar to 2001, I just I just don't see it, Bob. I, I am not at a place where I could give this movie a very high score. It, it Like you said, it meanders in certain places. I'm not sure of what the overall message is. Uh, it, the sound design in this movie in certain parts are, are phenomenal. Like the choice to have them play Ride of the Valkyrie is is great and it it adds such a depth to the comedic element of the American forces. It's great. But by the end of the film, I almost feel like I'm watching a sci-fi movie. Did mm -hmm. you ever get that feeling? Yeah, the score was really of the moment, right? Like it had all the synthesizers and it it just it felt like it was out of a late 70s, early 80s sci-fi film. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, and that and like I really struggled with that because I was like, I don't know, I don't want my war films sounding like like they should be a sci-fi film. So there, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff going on in this movie that I struggled with, and interestingly enough, I I feel like a lot of people analyze this movie to death and like talk about the meaning of the film. For me, I I don't feel like I really struggled with the meaning of the film at all. No, I, like I feel like it was it was pretty obvious what Coppola was trying to say about humanity, about the darkness in human hearts, about the American war effort and, you know, how depraved he thought it was like all that came across I don't know, pretty clearly to me. I, I did that. Did that feel similarly to you? Bob? Absolutely. And, you know, going back to that first scene, which you, you know, it kind of tipped off to you that it was going to be kind of a weird movie. I actually really love that first sequence. And I truly think that as this movie goes on, it gets worse. The first two thirds, I really think were like a 10 out of 10 to me. And that last third with Brando is where things really just go off the rails. But in particular, that first sequence, which is, you know, nearly wordless, except for the narration that's going on over it. You're just watching this character that you're just meeting for the first time unravel like you said it's ptsd he is mentally unstable he's drinking himself into a stupor and you can tell the effect that this war has had on him 
And I think it really adds to those early scenes that you know that your protagonist is clearly unstable and it just underscores the idea that, you know, the people that the army are are using to carry out their plans are these really, really unstable people. And I think that really helps the I don't want to call it necessarily the, the satirical element, but I think it definitely plays into that a little bit. And so you're right, Brad, like what Coppola is trying to do with this movie is really, really clear. And I think that's why the ending of the movie really just pisses me off because it doesn't really help underscore the the point of the movie really at all. Do you know what I mean? Like you find out at the very beginning that this guy Kurtz has gone off the rails and then you watch as Martin Sheen waffles back and forth on like, is he really wrong or is he just fed up with what the army's doing? Because you can see it both ways. And then he gets to the island and he sees what Brando's doing and he's like, oh, no, this guy's clearly just in the wrong and he needs to be killed. Are you an assassin? I'm a soldier. You're neither. You're an errand boy. Sent by grocery clerks. And it's like there no bigger questions really arise for me out of that last, you know, 35, 40 minutes. It just, you know, and, and if you look at the backstory of the movie, you know, one of the biggest issues that Coppola had shooting it was that he did not have an ending. He hated the ending that was written and he decided, you know, I'm going to land on one of two things. Either I'm going to end with the airstrike being called in and everybody getting bombed. Or I'm going to end with what he ultimately did, which was him killing Brando, rescuing, you know, the one uh, soldier that went with him and both of them just kind of silently retreating upriver. And the movie, you know, to quote the the poem that's recited in there, it, it doesn't end with a bang. It ends with a whimper. And it just for me, man, I just feel like it lost so much steam in that last half hour that I was just ready for it to be over. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to the end of the movie and I was almost like angry that I had spent all that time watching it and like investing a little bit of emotional energy where I was like, man, I like I was waiting for something and all I got was like legitimately what felt like an acid trip of a ending and like, I don't know, I and I guess maybe this is transitioning us into talking about like the performances but I, I actually really didn't like Martin Sheen very much in this. Oh. And part of it comes down to the end of the film when, like, literally throughout the entire film, I've seen him make one face the entire time. Like, he's just been deadpan the entire movie. And then the one thing that gets him to freak out is, uh, what's his face, his head, the chef? Yeah. Chef's head being tossed in his lap. All of a sudden, he's, like, cussing and swearing and crying but everything else in the movie that he sees, he's just deadpan and like quietly dead, like dead in the eye watching. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, dude, but I really did not like Martin Sheen in this movie. I actually liked his voiceover a decent amount. I felt like there's a little bit of character given there, but the actual like acting performance to me was just super underwhelming. Yeah, you know, I actually really liked him in this movie, but I... I agree with almost everything you're saying. He was very one dimensional. I think that's by design. And I think that he did it to the best that he possibly could. We all know Martin Sheen is a fantastic actor. Like anyone who's ever watched the West Wing, you know, this guy's a great actor. And I oh, do yeah, think the sure. narration definitely helps this movie. Like whether people like the narration as an additional thing that was put in or not, I think the narration helps this movie tremendously. And it definitely helps with Martin Sheen's characterization. In terms of the performances, I think it's pretty hard to ignore Robert Duvall because he just comes in and gets to be larger than life and chew scenery and then leave. And he's in the best part of the movie and then he's gone. He's, he's not there when any of the fatty parts of the movie come out. And, you know, he gets nominated for an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. I think it's well deserved. But I also think it says a lot about this movie that the most memorable person in this movie is one of the people that's on screen for the least amount of time. 11 minutes, actually. There, there you go. I also think it's just fascinating that a few weeks ago we watched Network and Beatrice Street was nominated for and she won an Oscar for a performance that, I mean, her screen time was like four or five minutes. Yes, yeah, 
For sure. It's fascinating to me that we had two movies really close to each other in the 70s where you had these teeny tiny role performances where, man, they just they knocked it out of the park. And I, I will give Robert Duvall credit. He was given, I mean, just a fastball right down the middle of the plate and he knocked a grand slam with it. So, Brad, this gets me back to Coppola, though, because I think we can't really go on any longer without talking about some of the behind the scenes stuff from this movie. Like the the production of this movie is so insanely chaotic that it's it's more legendary than the movie itself in some ways. And you were talking about how people seem to put this movie in their top 10. And I was saying it's especially directors that love this movie. And the reason for that is like. The generation of filmmakers that Coppola came up with, like he was kind of the elder statesman of this group of people that used to hang out that all were affiliated with the USC film school and the Southern California movie making scene. It was him Mm -hmm. and Scorsese and Spielberg and Brian De Palma. They all hung out together and he was. Uh, You're you're forgetting my boy, George Lucas. And George Lucas. Sure. Come come on. All right. All right. So. They all hung out together. Coppola was the most successful. Obviously, then he makes The Godfather. He blows up. Um, but they all like worshipped at the altar of the classical Hollywood filmmakers. They were like heavy into the idea of the director being the author of the movie. And, you know, like their wet dream was having total control over a movie the way that Coppola had over this movie. And we're going to talk in the second half of the episode about like some of the things that we we struggle with, with this idea of the auteur theory and the director should be able to just lord over a movie like this. But I think it's worth mentioning now that like this movie, I think is kind of the pinnacle of what a director could do when given complete free reign with a movie. Like it's just completely chaotic. The fact that they were even able to scrape together a somewhat coherent movie out of all that, I think is admirable. And like Brad, I enjoy this movie. I think it's a good movie. But I also can really tell, I think, just from knowing how Coppola makes movies, from watching movies like The Godfather and The Conversation, the beginning part of this movie, I was in awe of how well controlled everything was. Like the the sequences of Duvall bombing that beach in the whole village, it's so well choreographed and there were so many moving parts. I was like, good Lord, how did they pull this off? And even part of that up river journey where they're flying under, you know, crashed B-52 bombers and stuff. I'm like, man, how much money must they have spent on that? And then by the time they get to that complex that Brando is holed up in, you can sense that it's it just feels like they are splicing together different things that they were coming up with on the fly. Like it just you can just tell watching the movie that sense of control really just seems to fall out from under this movie. I mean, it it honestly feels to me like they embraced the old saying, if you wait till the last minute, it'll only take a minute. Mm. Like it really just feels like, like you said, Bob, they didn't know what ending they wanted and they waited till the last minute when they were out of money, out of sanity. You know, Coppola is mortgaging his own home to try and get this done. Like, Like the whole production process was so insane that it almost feels like at the end of it, you know, they famously were at like a million and a half feet of film, right? Right. That like at that point they were like, all right, this is enough. We're done. We're like, we have the film. We'll make the movie in the editing room. And for being such a fan of the, the outer theory and somebody who wanted complete control over his film... I think that Coppola gave the studios all the reason they needed to never give so much control to a director ever again. Brad, I think this is a really good place for us to kind of hit pause because in the second half of the episode, I do want to kind of go in a little bit on the production and and the trouble that it had. You know, that's an understatement, but also a little bit more on this question of like, should we let directors have this much control? But before we do that, I think it's time for us to drink some whiskey. So what do you say we press pause and we try this J.W. Dant? I am 100% in.
right, so today we are checking out J.W. Dant Bottled and Bond. Brad, this is one of my favorite budget whiskeys. This is made by Heaven Hill. It costs $15 a bottle, and it is a phenomenal, reliable pour every single time. And to set the mood, to set some background here, Brad, we are coming... Tell, tell me a story, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> we are coming at you today from Crafted Cocktail Company in Wadsworth, Ohio. We've done a couple episodes here and some bonus episodes as well. It is awesome to be in this place looking at you through a nice sheet of plexiglass. Bob, we're back at it again. We're doing it. I feel like you're the uh, the T-Rex in uh, Jurassic Park. And the gonna, kids are like looking through the, <laughs> through the roof. I'm just going to start just, like clawing at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brad, last season we tried JTS Brown Bottled and Bond which is also a budget bourbon that is made by Heaven Hill. These two are often compared. They are in the exact same bottle with a different colored cap. So when people look at Heaven Hill's kind of budget lineup, it's J.W. Dant, it's J.T.S. Brown, and it's Mellow Corn. Those are all of their bottled and bond cheap whiskeys. And we all know that Mellow Corn is garbage. Yeah, we do not like so Mellow Corn on this on podcast. From one that. of our apparently one of our hottest takes ever. <laughs> we tried J.T.S. Brown last year. We both liked it a lot. And we have not tried it since. So what I've done today, Brad, is is in front of us, we have the JW Dance, but I also want us to compare it back to the JTS Brown because it seems like people usually like one better than the other. All right, man. So let's jump into this JW Dance. This is a, like I said, it's a 100 proof whiskey. It is pretty cheap, but I like it a lot and I'm anxious to hear what you think. What are you picking up on the nose? Yeah, Bob, honestly, this has a nice, delicate aroma to it. It's a, It's a little bit, there's there's like a hint of fruitiness to it that's underlaid by the brown sugary kind mm -hmm. of soft sweet notes. I actually really like it a, a lot. Yeah, for me I get a lot of floral notes on this. Like it it really does smell like a bouquet of flowers to me. It's not harsh at 100 proof. Like it really is a pretty inviting nose. Again, for 15 bucks, you're not going to be getting a ton of complexity here. There's not a lot of spice going on. Like Brad said, I, I get some vanilla and your classic bourbon notes. But I'm assuming this is only four years old because it's, you know, cheap. They're not going to be aging this for 10, 12 years. But with that really nice floral note going on, I think, Brad, I'm going to go ahead and give this a seven out of 10 on the nose. Yeah, the the longer I nose it, I, I feel like I'm noticing a little bit of like nuttiness to it, almost a peanut butter note mm -hmm. that is really, really pleasant. I'll, you know, for what it is, I'll give it a seven out of 10. Again, I always find that note of peanuts on uh, Heaven Hill products. I know a lot of people talk about the nuttiness of Jim Beam products. I get the peanut butter a lot on Heaven Hill. So we're both at a seven out of 10 here on the nose. Oh, yeah. All right, man. Let's give it a sip and see what we think. Oh, wow. That is really nice. Yeah, it's not bad. That is a pleasantly smooth drinker that, yeah, as it hits my palate, it's all about the peanut butter here. Yeah, for sure. And I, I will say that it definitely go, went a little bit bitter for me at the back of the taste. It, it got kind of aggressively oaky at the back, which I don't remember from drinking this before. And so, again, like it drinks a little bit thinner than I would like it to drink at 100 proof. It's pretty pleasantly, mildly sweet all the way through. There's not a lot of notes to it. It's got some peanut kind of, you know, some nuttiness to it. And then it turns oaky. I'm kind of iffy on this one today, Brad. I don't know if it's just where my palate's at, but I'm only going to give this a six out of 10 on the flavor. Yeah, I think flavor wise is where this one struggles. I'll, I'll get to finish in a second. I think it's fine on the finish. But on the palate itself, it's a little bit thin. It's not very viscous. And I feel like there's just a little bit missing that was promised from the nose, right? Uh, and I feel like a lot of times cheaper whiskeys that are still higher proof, like because the alcohol is bringing a lot forward on the nose, you almost feel like you're going to get something on the palate mm -hmm. that just doesn't end up being there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to give it a five out of 10 on the palate. It's not bad. You know, if this was in the middle of springtime of swill, like I think this would be performing extraordinarily well. This is one of the few times that I will say, Brad, a couple drops of water in this are like unlocking flavors that were not there before. The peanut butter is amplified like crazy. There's a lot of baking spice here. I get some great cinnamon notes on this. A lot of maple actually on this one, too. And it actually cuts down on how bitter that finish was for us. I would say that if they sold this at 90, 94 proof instead of 100 proof, it might be a better whiskey. Yeah, I'm right there with you. After adding a few drops of uh, distilled water, you, you're just getting a really beautiful f flavor profile here. But like you said, if they're if they're popping this off at 90, 92 proof, I think they'd ha they'd be really be onto something. 
Um, but as it is, the finish here, it's got a nice Kentucky hug to it. The oakiness is a little bit strong, a little bit bitter. But overall, it's it's a pretty solid finish. I'll give it a six out of ten. Yeah, and and I'm I think I'm right there with you, man. Uh, I would suggest either putting this on a big rock or adding a couple drops of water. I think it really cuts down on the bitterness of the finish. But again, we usually judge this based on how it drinks neat. And if we're just basing it on that, this is only about a six out of ten on the finish. And when we get to overall balance, I, you know, Bob, it's fifteen dollars, right? Like this isn't this isn't going to blow you away. And I think. A lot of times cheap whiskey really suffers in the balance because you might hit one or two parts of the whiskey. You're like, oh, that was pretty solid for fifteen dollars. But when you get to the end of it, I don't find it very often that you say that was a well balanced whiskey. Right. So, I, you know, I'll, I'll go back down to a five out of ten for balance. I think I think I'm actually going to give us a higher score on balance because it is 15 it is very good. Fifteen dollar whiskey throughout. And so because of that, like nothing really stood out to me in a negative way here. I think the the flavor was off a little bit, but it wasn't off so much that I was like, my gosh, how can they sell this for $15? Good Lord. How is this possible? <laughs> Call the so, authorities. So I'm going to give it a seven out of 10 on the overall balance. And that takes us to value. As we have said time and again, this is 15 bucks. How many? How many buckaroos? Is uh, that, Bob? 15. Wow. Hairs. 15 of them. Yes. Man, that's not many. No, not at all. Brad, at 15 bucks. I don't really know of any other bottled and bond whiskeys that we could even get. You're already talking about the lowest possible price point that you could have for this. I, I think at the price, it's very good whiskey. I'll give it an 8 out of 10 on value. I'm right there with you, Bob. 8 out of 10. I, I think it's a solid value for what you're getting. And anytime you can spend $15 on a bottle that you're not afraid to like give to an actual whiskey mm-hmm. person, I, I'm like, hey, I'm all about it. So I am at a 34 out of 50, and you're coming out to what, Brad? 31. All right. So we are at a 32 and a half out of 50, or a 65 out of 100, just a little bit below that 35 mark of recommending to try or to buy. I'm, I'm going to recommend you buy it. It's 15 bucks. Like, yeah. Like, why wouldn't you? Exactly. <laughs> Go buy it. But here's the important thing, Brad. I also poured out a little bit of JTS Brown for us to sample alongside this. And without, you know, rehashing our review, take a sip of this. Tell me what the immediate differences are and which one do you prefer? You know, the JTS Brown has a little bit more of a corn flavor to it Mm -hmm. that I'm not enjoying as much. I think I'm going to lean towards the Dant. Yeah, I think I feel like my preferred one of these would fall somewhere in between both of their flavor profiles. So you're just going to mix them together? Yeah, I am going (laughs) to. I'm going to mix them together. (laughs) I think the Brown would hold up better in a cocktail. I think the Dant is better for drinking neat or with a couple drops of water. I have zero arguments with you there, Bob. All right, man. (laughs) So, Brad, uh, speaking of zero arguments, why don't we get back into talking about this masterpiece of 1970s cinema, Apocalypse Now? Oh, boy. Let's get to it. Alrighty, folks, that was J.W. Dant, a whiskey that for the budget that you're on, man, that was a pretty solid whiskey, Bob. Oh, absolutely, man. If you got 13 bucks laying around and you can find it on the shelf, it is definitely worth it. Yeah. And honestly, if you are up in the Northeast Ohio area, I cannot recommend Crafted Cocktail enough. And I, guy, I'm not going to lie. When I drove up and saw the place, it like, if I'm being honest, it's just in a strip mall Mm -hmm. and it looks like nothing. And then I walked into that bar, and Bob, Bob knows this. I don't know if everybody knows this. I lived in Philadelphia for a year, um, like in the city itself, and it was an amazing experience. But that, the Crafted Cocktail in Wadsworth, Ohio, I walked into that bar and felt like I was at a top-end, like center city cocktail bar in Philadelphia. Mm. I mean, it is gorgeous. The bartenders know their stuff. Scott Sauer, the beverage director there who pretty much runs the place, the dude is a genius when it comes to cocktails. So if, you, if you're if you in town 
go check it out. But honestly, I'm really curious. This movie is such a weird movie. Understatement. And there's so much going on with the film. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird movie. Understatement of the year. But there's like so much going on with this film that it, I feel like it was easy for us to get away from our traditional stuff. And before we get into what we said we were going to talk about, I'm just curious, Bob, like what were some of your favorite moments in this film? Like, was there anything that stood out to you? Was there like a moment of music or acting that you just you just really loved? You know, honestly, this is going to sound like a huge downer, but I thought that the best put together sequence in the whole movie is where they pull over the junk boat that's full of people and they are so skittish and so ready to just shoot someone that they kind of talk themselves into believing that these people have guns or explosives on board. And then all of a sudden, you know, Lawrence Fishburne on the the machine gun just massacres everybody on that boat. And they're left realizing, oh, the thing that this woman was hiding was a puppy that was hiding in this basket. And I thought that scene just did such a fantastic job of portraying how trigger happy these people were that something as small as that could set them off. And it really underscored this idea of like that that scene is a microcosm to Coppola of what America was doing in Vietnam. Like we are going into a situation we don't understand. We are looking for aggressors. And when we're not finding them, we're making someone else into the aggressors so that they can be annihilated. Like that was the clearest, most pure version of, I think what Coppola was trying to get across with this movie in one scene. And I think, again, that's like why I'm so pissed off with other parts of the movie for not sticking to that vision as clearly, because I thought that sequence was so well shot, so well edited, and it really had a a really powerful impact for me. Ah, dang on it, Bob! That was like that that was mine. I was I was supposed to talk about <laughs> yeah. that section, dude. I I'm not gonna lie. As after watching the movie and kind of reflecting on it, that scene actually reminded me that this this might be a little bit of a reach, but I, honestly, I don't care anymore. That scene reminded me of the political state of America right this very moment in 2021. Mm. Like, I feel like we have so forced people who don't agree with us on on usually political things. We have forced them so far to the other side of the aisle. Man, it just feels like they're complete foreigners to us. And we're ready to mow them down at the slightest sign of provocation. Mm, Yeah. And so that honestly, I think that scene really was one of the most powerful in the whole movie. Um, But I guess if I had to talk about a scene outside of that, I'm curious, what do you do when you watch a movie and there's a scene that you can just tell the director just wants you to like? Are you supposed to like it then? Or should you like analyze it and go, "Mm, yes, he's trying to say something deeper here? Because I feel like the entire character of Bill Kilgore is painted with such a broad brush it's very obvious who he is supposed to be, what he's representing, and you're supposed to like like him and yet not like him because he's so likable. Like I guess I just always get confused when there are characters or scenes or parts of the script where like I don't know, I I guess Coppola just feels so heavy-handed in what he's trying to say that I'm not sure if I'm supposed to like him or not. Does that well, make see, sense? For me, I don't really know if it's necessarily that it's heavy-handed as much as Again, I think the movie like almost gives you whiplash in the way that it kind of goes back and forth on which genre it wants to fall into. Because Coppola himself said that the draft of this script by John Milius was a comedy. And, you know, I don't know if he means that it was like an out and out comedy or if it was more just a satire, and which could be dark, you know, in, in the vein of a network. Right. And that whole sequence reminded me of network. It had that sort of snarky, cynical satirical edge to it of like, this guy is a freaking idiot. Like, I mean, he's smart, you know, he's an intelligent guy, but all he wants to do, all he cares about while they're massacring people is look over there. Look at how those waves are cresting. That's six feet on those. And you can just tell like exactly what they're trying to say in a very satirical way there. But by the end of the movie, again, like they're not doing the satirical thing. They're they're trying to make another metaphorical point about like, oh, this is what America's doing here. We want to be worshipped like gods. But they're doing it in a much more dramatic way, a much more kind of like psychedelic way. And I think that that's what makes the the picture get so muddied is that they don't really stick to one way 
of making their overarching point. In the early going of the movie, it's done with some more comedic elements. It's done in a more satirical way. At the end of the movie, you know, they're trying to get into like these deep platonic philosophical discussions. And I don't think it, it really does just feel like I'm watching two separate movies. Yeah. And, and it doesn't work. Like they, yeah. they have, they strike such a discordant tone from one another. I'm, I guarantee you there's somebody out there who's going, oh, well, Bob and Brad, uh, of course they're supposed to strike a discordant tone. That's the whole point of the movie. Okay. Well, I, I just think it doesn't work. I, I think that it almost ruins the point of each other to have a movie that is so at odds and at war with itself. All right. So let's, let's do this, man. Let's talk about it because. I texted you this last night. I was trying to get a feel for what you thought of the movie. And I said that I can see why someone would call it a masterpiece because I think the filmmaking technique is there. I, like there's clearly a, a genius behind the camera here. But even in my opinion, geniuses can get in over their heads sometimes. And I think one of the things that really bothers me about the lingering effects of the auteur theory, the idea that the director is an author and the director is in complete control of the vision of a movie. It like it still lingers to this day where I think there's been a couple directors in history that have been kind of like canonized in a way that people don't talk about them making bad movies or people don't really allow for the possibility that like, you know what, maybe their movie was just a turd and it didn't work. It's almost like, you know, we talked about this with 2001. Like, if you don't like it, it's because you don't get it, right? There's something wrong with you, the viewer. Kubrick is a genius, and he wanted to be esoteric, and he wanted to make things that weren't easy to understand. And I think that that's bullshit, to be honest, Brad. Like, I, I really think that it's possible to get exactly what a filmmaker is trying to say and come down on, you know, the side of things where he just didn't do it very well. And I kind of think that's what's going on here. And again, I'm saying that from a position of someone who thinks this movie is really, really good. It just doesn't measure up to the level of masterpiece that I think some people want it to be. Right. And and I think that's honestly, that's a big reason why for me, this film felt so much like 2001, that this is a movie that people just ardently defend as like this, this masterpiece of film. And I just go, well, I think you're obsessed with the fact that it was made by a specific person who is easy to, you know, worship in the cinema world. And the and the production was really hard. And so it so and so it's great. And I'm like, well, just because of those things and just because it has like a psychedelic, esoteric, that, that's a good word. Just because it has this esoteric feel to it doesn't make it a great film. In fact, the fact that it becomes so esoteric is what really removes it from feeling like it has any impact on reality for me. Yeah, like, I mean, like, if, but you texted me back and said, there's parts of this movie that are brilliant, and overall, I thought it was just Coppola jerking off for two and a half hours. Yeah. And honestly, like, you know, to be a little less vulgar about it, it does seem kind of masturbatory. It really does just seem like a guy that is indulging himself and thinking that he is making this grand philosophical statement. And it really does just there's parts of this movie for me that come off as pretentious. And again, yeah, I don't know if you're with me on this, but but if the whole movie had stuck to the tone of the first two thirds of the movie, I probably would give this a 10 out of 10. And I think that the point he was trying to make was so crystal clear that even if it was a little heavy handed at points, it you know, you knew what he was trying to say. And by the end of the movie, it was just it did seem like someone who was just like throwing stuff at the wall in the most pretentious way possible, who believed in his own, you know, mythos as a director and believed that he was this grand artist. And it just it doesn't work for me. Honestly, Bob, I I I walked away from that film and I was ready to give it like a three out of ten. Wow. Really? I I I know that I have hidden it throughout this episode. Like I've been open about the fact that I didn't care for it. I hated this movie. <laughs> I thought it was the most pretentious piece of garbage I had ever seen. And there were <laughs> there were certain scenes where I was like, okay, I get why that's like famous. I understand the smell of napalm line. Um, honestly, I, the one part of the final scene I liked 
was the line where he said, you know, it won't end with a bang, but a whimper. I was like, oh man, that's like, that's deep and meaningful. And it's surrounded by gobbledygook and a terrible performance from Martin Sheen. And I, I just disliked this movie so, so much. All right. So before we, before we jump into final scores, let's play devil's advocate with ourselves for just a second, because we we haven't really touched on the production troubles of this movie, right? Like Coppola is given a bunch of money to go off and make this movie. They go to uh, the Philippines, I think, to film it. And one of the first things that happens when they're already running behind schedule is that a giant monsoon comes and destroys 80% of the sets. So now they have to build rebuild sets and it's already spiraling out of control. There's so much money being dumped into it. Coppola is starting to funnel his own money into it. And then Martin Sheen has a heart attack and almost dies. And they are without him for weeks and weeks. And they're trying to keep that under wraps because, you know, Martin Sheen didn't want to put the movie behind anymore. But now they're having to use body doubles. And while all this is happening, Marlon Brando is playing hardball with when's he going to show up? How long does he want to work for? I think they contracted him for three weeks, but he wanted a million dollars in advance. And I think another million dollars once he got there. And once he showed up, He was so fat. He was so overweight that they could not film him the way that they wanted to film him. They could only film him like from the shoulders up. That's why he's shrouded in darkness for so much of the movie. All the shots of him in silhouette were actually a body body double. And all this time, Coppola is trying to figure out what's the ending of my movie. And now you have Marlon Brando coming in and completely screwing all that up as well. So like. I do respect and admire that they got something out of this. And I'm in a completely different place than you, Brad. I actually think this is a really, really good movie. But I just cannot emphasize enough how much that Marlon Brando sequence ruins what went before it. Yeah, I I was actually kind of getting curious. I, I wanted to know what you thought of Brando's performance. And like, interestingly enough, I I don't feel like he gave a terrible performance of his own, but the ending was so unclear and so just psychedelically strange and awkward. And then, like you said, if there's issues with him being just a fat old fart at that point who is lazy and pretentious and thinks he's better than everyone else... Like, I I just can't imagine him locking horns with Coppola, who also, in my opinion, <laughs> was pretty pretentious at that point, and it going well. So I, I, I'm at yeah. a place where, yeah, the, the whole movie is just psychotic. And honestly, from, from what I read about the production and how Coppola drove his his team, you know, the the actors, the the set design, just, you know, everybody who made the movie, I just feel like it was... It was dangerous. It was way too far to the extreme. The fact that he apparently was like kind of helping and like financing a dictator at the time. Uh, I feel like there's some moral concerns there. <laughs> like they had to return yeah. the attack helicopters that the Filipino army lent to them because the Filipino army was crushing a rebel uprising. Like that, like, right. you know, there's a few problems with that. But hey, like it's American Hollywood and. As long as we make a few bucks off of a bunch of Americans, then it's okay to do whatever you want. I, I don't so there know, was man. A, there was a documentary that was made about about the making of this movie, and it's become really famous in Hollywood. It's called Hearts of Darkness. It's actually included on the Blu-ray. And one of the first things they talk about is how, you know, man, if we had done this movie in America, we would have had to pay each member of the crew that was building this temple $100 a day or whatever it was, and we were paying these people $1 a day. And then the guy that was talking was like, oh, man, I hope we weren't taking advantage of people. And I'm like, (laughs) I think the the ironic thing about this movie is that as Coppola is criticizing American imperialism and America as the aggressor of the world, he's going into a poor Asian country and completely exploiting the people that are working for him, whether they're Americans or Filipinos. Like, it's just it, it. It blows my mind how narrow minded and, you know, nearsighted he was about all this. Well, and that's I I come back to a point I made earlier in this podcast. There's a reason studios don't give directors the control that they used to. And it's because of crap like this. Like, 
Like, you can't get away with stuff like this in today's world, and you shouldn't be allowed to. I don't know. I I feel like I'm jumping into, like, cancel culture here. (laughs) But I'm just like, no, like, you can't do that. That's bad. And, no, I, and I and I will say, I think that you can evaluate the product separate from the circumstances surrounding it. And that's where my struggle is, is when I evaluate the product here, I just I, I did not have many positive impressions from this movie. So here's the, here's my big struggle with it. Then, Brad, is that, you know, this movie comes out finally in 1979 after starting production in 1976. And. You know, it's it's pretty well reviewed. It gets nominated for Best Picture. It is a colossal movie. Like, and I think you can tell that just by not just the 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 philosophical questions it's trying to ask, but like how big the sets were, how big the production was, you know, the filmmaking technique that's on display. But the movie doesn't win Best Picture. It gets beat by Kramer versus Kramer, a you know, comparatively small movie about divorce with Dustin Hoffman and Meryl Streep. A good movie. But I don't think anybody would argue that, like, the filmmaking of Apocalypse Now is 50 times better than Kramer versus Kramer. And I think when you have a movie like Apocalypse Now, it presents a really interesting question, which is when a genius makes a movie that is not a masterpiece, it's hard to completely evaluate it fairly because what works works at such a level that it's like it is above anything else that came out that year. And then what doesn't work is kind of a colossal, spectacular failure. Do you know what I mean? And and there is a part of me that respects how much this movie is swinging for the fences. It just doesn't always get there for me. So I guess my question to you is like. You've seen enough movies for this podcast now that I think you can tell like this is a well made movie, at least the parts that were planned out in advance are very well made. And you can tell that there's a genius behind the camera. but. When you've come to movies like this, where it's a genius filmmaker and it just doesn't quite work for you, how do you reconcile those two things? Well, it's interesting. I I think one of the reasons I'm being so harsh on this film is because we just watched The Godfather a few weeks ago. Like, Like, if I'm being honest, looking at The Godfather compared to this, I just feel like I feel like a lot of this movie is a lot more messy uh, in my opinion, than than what you're saying, Bob, when I compare it to The Godfather, mm-hmm. like th- like that movie is so tight, it works on almost every level, and the the narrative just drives forward relentlessly, challenging all of the characters in the movie, and and I really like that about The Godfather. This one just it it just meanders. A lot of scenes go on way too long. Um, the characters are either completely opaque and impossible to see through, or they're completely transparent. And like, it's so obvious what Coppola is trying to do with them that I just didn't feel like there was anybody really compelling for me. Um, we didn't really talk about him at all, but I thought that the captain of the boat, Albert played by Albert Phillips, I think he was my favorite character of the movie. I I thought that his performance was just spectacular because you see him interact with the troops around him with grace and compassion and a little bit of harshness. And he has a firm control. And I I really liked him a lot. And I'm right there with you with uh, Frederick Forrest, who played chef. I thought he was great, like really, truly good in this movie. Yeah. So there's a Uh, lot. There's a lot to like here. Brad, I know we're I mean, we're kind of running a little bit long. And I don't want this to, at least from my end, I don't want this to just be me shitting on this movie for an hour because I'm going to come out to a score that's probably going to catch you off guard here. And I guess I'll go first because it's time for final scores. Brad, I'm going to give this movie an eight and a half out of ten. I think what works about it is working at such a level that like it, it truly honestly blows me away. Like the first two thirds of this movie, I'm like, my gosh, this is a masterpiece. And the last the last third is just like. It, it, it's garbage. <laughs> you know what I mean? But what worked about it worked so well that I can't just dismiss this movie. And so I'm I'm going to come out to an eight and a half on this. Bob, I think that for me, something you said that really is sticking with me is that it really swung for the fences. And like that is an argument that I used when I gave, I think, Interstellar an eight and a half mm-hmm. that Nolan, he just doesn't go small. He always swings for the fences. And and so I, I actually you kind of you kind of hit me hard there. That's something that's sticking with me. I think for me, 
the most direct comparison for this film that I can think of is, you know, the Space Odyssey. And so, and I gave that movie a six out of 10. I liked this movie a little bit less. And so I think I'm going to give this a five and a half out of 10. Wow, that's actually higher than I thought you would be. I thought you were going to come out to like a three and a half. Dude, I started, I literally on IMDb rated it as a three. (laughs) <laughs> like I got done watching it. I was like, forget this man. This, Coppola is full of himself. He thinks he's just like hot crap. I Like I'm over it. This dude's an idiot. Three out of 10. So we brought you but, up a whole two and a half points. You did, man. I like, there is a lot to like about this movie. If this is one of your favorite movies, you know, tell us why, like hit us up on the socials, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, we're at film whiskey, but like, For me, this movie just didn't work a ton. There was parts of it that, sure, yeah, they were great. I I think that the, we we mentioned it before, but the Flight of the Valkyrie sequence, holy cow, man, that's like stagecoach on crack. Oh, yeah. Like, that kind of a set piece was just insane to do. Um, But other parts of it didn't work as much. So, like I said, let us know what you have to say about it. Yeah, you could also leave us a voicemail if you go to our Anchor website, anchor.fm slash filmwhiskey. Let us know what you think of the movie. Let us know if you think either one of us is just completely out of whack here, and we'll play it on air. Brad, next week, I think this is a really interesting transition. We're going from this epic movie to another epic movie, 1992's Malcolm X. And Brad, this is a Spike Lee movie that I think, honestly, might be the one of the most slept-on movies in history. It is epic filmmaking done the way that it is supposed to be done. I absolutely cannot wait for you to watch that movie. Yeah, it's a it's a film I have not seen before, and I am very, very interested to get into. All right, well, we'll see what Brad thinks of that one next week. Until then, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time.